On behalf of the Meisinger family, I want to extend uh, thanks to all of you for taking the time out of your lives, out of your schedules, out of the busyness that we all have in our lives to take this time to come and support the family and to celebrate the life and the ministry and the testimony of Dr. George Meisinger. As we come together for a memorial service, we are here for basically three reasons. I like to go over this because there's grandkids here. They may not have been to a memorial service. There are also folks I discovered that, that may not quite understand the significance of a memorial service for a believer. We're here, first of all, to remember, to remember George, to remember who he was, what he meant to us. But this isn't about George. A memorial service for a believer looks at the believer, remembers his life, his impact on us, but it's not about them. It's about what the Lord Jesus Christ did through them and the miraculous way the grace of God was exhibited and what and how he served the Lord in our lives. The next thing that happens in a memorial service is as we remember, we begin to grieve. We grieve, but as the scripture says, not as those who have no hope. And so we need to talk a little bit about grief. And then third, we rejoice, because as our Lord bequeathed to us his joy, George knows that now in a way we can never imagine and that should be very much a part of our response. Even in the midst of the grief, we also have that great joy that our Lord gave to us. I'm going to begin with a reading of scripture. I'm gonna read two passages. The first is from Ecclesiastes chapter three, verses one through eight. And then I will also read from 2 Corinthians chapter five, verses one through 10. But first, let me open in prayer. Oh, Father, as we come together this morning, as the family of George Meisinger, his immediate physical, natural family on this earth, but also those who are related to him because of our regeneration, our rebirth in Christ, members of your royal family. And Father, we are just so so very thankful for George's life, for his focus on you, his dedication to serving the Lord, his focus on the word and the ministry of the word, and not only working uh, in the lives of, of those he ministered to as a pastor, but also to the many uh, students and pastors that he impacted with his life, as well as those he taught uh, overseas as he went on uh, missions trips here and there. Father, what an example he has been in, in the way he walked with you. And Father, we are so encouraged by that. Let it be a challenge to each of us to step to the plate as George did and uh, assume that role of focus on being a disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, Father, we pray that as we reflect upon his life and how you used him in our lives. As we focus upon your word, may we be strengthened and encouraged in our own faith, our own walk with you, and challenged to, uh, to walk with endurance through the difficult times of life as George did, always exhibiting that joy, that graciousness that was his only because of Christ. And we pray this in Jesus' precious name, amen. Ecclesiastes chapter three. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck what is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones 
and a time to embrace, or a time to gather stones, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to gain, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to throw away, a time to tear, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to, to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. Second passage, second passage is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, for in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident because we know that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to him. At this point, George's son Joe is going to come up to read the obituary. <clears throat> George passed away at the age of 80 on March 12, 2019. He is survived by his beloved wife, Sandra Meisinger. George was preceded in death by his oldest son, James Meisinger, in 2017. He is survived by his daughter-in-law, Shannon Meisinger, wife of Jim, of Portland, Oregon, son Keith Meisinger, and his wife Erica of Plymouth, Minnesota, daughter Michelle Hoagland of Lake Forest, California, and son Joe Meisinger and his wife Kristen of Parker, Colorado. He is also survived by 12 grandchildren, Stephen, Sarah, husband Joe Baldwin, John, Luke, Gracie, Allie, Michael, Jonathan, Matthew, Madeline, Hannah, and Hayden. George's earthly vessel was interred on March 15, 2019, with close family and friends present. George was born in Eugene, Oregon on April 21, 1938, to parents George and Priscilla Meisinger. He was welcomed into the world by his oldest sister, Pat, and was followed two years later by his younger, younger brother, Terry, when George was three years old, his father passed away unexpectedly. His mother remarried a few years later to Jim Wiltsey, and later the family was joined by Jim's grandson, Kurt, who became George's adopted brother. For many years, George's mother owned Wiltsey Weathers, a successful music studio and store in Salem, Oregon, and passed her love of music on to her children. Growing up, George learned to play many instruments, including the accordion and the vibraharp, and performed with his family, after high school, he and his brother moved to Hollywood to try their luck in the, in the music industry. He later went to Grand Canyon College in Arizona to study music, and after one year, moved back to California to attend Biola College in La Mirada, California, to continue his study of music. While at Biola, Biola, he heard professors from Dallas Theological Seminary speak and decided he wanted to enter the ministry. That same year at Biola, <laughs> he also met a spunky freshman from Walnut Creek California, named Sandy Johnson. <laughs> they quickly fell in love and George proposed a month after a month of dating. A year later they married and after George graduated college, sorry, there's dust up here or something. <laughs> and after George graduated college, they drove across the country to Dallas, Texas. George enrolled at Dallas Theological Seminary where he majored in Hebrew and Old Testament. During the seminary years, George and Sandy welcomed sons Jim and Keith. 
After seminary graduation in 1968, George accepted his first pastorate in Minnetonka, Minnesota. Within the next few years, they welcomed brother, daughter Michelle, and son Joseph. During his 17-year tenure at Woodland Hills Bible Church, George saw the church grow from a Bible study of a few families to a church building with several hundred congregants. George loved studying and preaching the word, and many were hungry for his expository preaching of the scripture. George, Sandy, and the kids have many lifelong friends from their time in Minnesota. I'll be ready in a second. George also made sure to take the family on road trips every summer to visit relatives and friends in other states. In 1986, George accepted a pastorate in Huntington Beach, California. The family moved across the country but without their oldest son, Jim, as he was attending the United States Military Academy at West Point, New York. A year after arriving in California, George founded Grace Church in Orange, California. He presided over the church for 20 years, during which time his children married and blessed him and Sandy with 12 grandchildren. Also during his time at this church, he and some other pastors achieved their dream of founding Schaefer Theological Seminary. The seminary ran for a few years in Southern California, but after a while, it became clear that the seminary students struggled with attending the seminary due to the high cost of living in California. Schaefer's governing board scoured the country for a less expensive place for the seminary, and in 2007, George retired from pastoring, and he and Sandy moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico. George and Sandy have enjoyed their years in Albuquerque. George taught classes at Hoffman Town Church for several years while also acting as president of Schaefer's seminary. He continued studying and writing daily in his office and loved to buy new technological gadgets to make his life easier. In the summer of 2013, George was diagnosed with cancer, which he lived with for the, next, for the last six years of his life. In spite of the ups and downs of his disease, he was still active in studying, working, and writing a book about the life of King Saul. Through it all, George and Sandy trusted Almost there. Trusted in God's goodness and sovereignty in all areas of their lives. George went home to be with the Lord on March 12, 2019. George and Sandy were married for 56 years. Thank you so much, Joe. Uh, my name is David Hopkins. I'm one of the pastors here at Hoffman Town Church. In fact, I'm the music and worship pastor, and Sandy's in our worship choir, and uh, it's just been an honor to come alongside the family during this time. It was great to see you all here this morning, but just want to especially let Sandy and Keith and Michelle and Joe know that our hearts and our prayers are with you guys right now and in the days ahead. So uh, as has already been mentioned in uh, Joe's eulogy, uh, Brother George loved music. And I like to kind of think that he and I were kindred spirits because we both had a love for music and theology and especially music that was theological. So that is Christian music. And George especially loved the hymns. And the family has asked me to lead you all in some hymns today. And so we're going to start with a very unique setting of All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Now those of us who are Baptists are used to the coronation setting of this hymn, but uh, Schaefer Seminary adopted the diadem arrangement of this particular hymn, and they would often sing this at their chapel services and so forth. So we're going to ask you to stand with us as we lift up this great hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus. Name. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem, 
and crown him, crown him, crown him, crown him, and crown him, Lord of all. Ye chosen seed. Ye chosen seed of Israel's race, he ransomed from the fall, he ransomed from the fall, hail him who saved you by his grace and cry. Crown him Lord of all. Let every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial ball, on this terrestrial ball, to him all majesty ascribe and cry. Join the everlasting song and crown. Crown him, crown him, crown him and crown. This time we're going to. Wait a minute. If I can get this out, okay. I think this will be better, and I can move a little bit. At this time, we're going to go through some remembrances to from different folks, how they remember uh, George and his ministry and his life and impact on their lives. The first one I'm going to uh, read to you. It is from Jim Myers. Now, for those of you who don't know, my name is Robbie Dean. I'm the pastor of West Houston Bible Church. And in 2000, Jim Myers, who is a missionary in Ukraine, was putting together a pastor's conference in uh, Almaty in Kazakhstan. And George and I went over there and taught together. That was a great time. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. But Jim and George go back uh, at least 50 years. Jim writes, a friend for more than 50 years, ever the teacher. Every moment is a teachable moment for him. Always a word of encouragement, always an expression of concern for your situation and especially your spiritual life. A humble man, a man of integrity, a man devoted to the study and propagation of the word of God equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. In doctrine, a model of integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, a man who pressed toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. A shepherd who took, care, took the care of his flock most seriously, always willingly, never for fame or dishonorable gain. And when the chief shepherd appears, surely he will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. A joy to know it was my honor to be his friend. We're going to have three folks come up. 
Uh, Joe and Marianne Melton from Minnesota, why don't you all start walking to the front? They were part of George's congregation there in Minnesota. They will be followed by Ann Marshall, who was in his congregation in California and also a student at Chafer Seminary. And then she will be followed by Bill McCullough here in Albuquerque. So as each finishes, the next person can just walk up here and begin. I will hand you the microphone. Can I put that right there? I'm Joe, she's the good looking one, <clears throat> it's Mary Ann. <clears throat> we had the privilege of uh, starting out with Joe and, uh, George and Sandy back in the early 70s in Minnetonka. <clears throat> I personally had stopped going to church because of legalism. We got introduced to George Meisinger through Mary Ann attending Bible study fellowship. George applied living by the Word of God, emphasis on growing in the Word of God, applying biblical principles in life. Besides my mom and dad and my wife, Mary Ann, the Word of God taught by George had the greatest influence on my life. We were under severe financial stress at that time, and the tutelage for 15 years by George was the greatest spiritual growth time in our life. It was obviously God's providential circumstances that set us up so that we could enjoy the growth in the Word of God. <clears throat> Be anxious for nothing but in everything through prayer and supplication and with thanksgiving. Let your needs be known. And George and Sandy were struggling and we were struggling. George had a sense of humor. Uh, for those of you that know me, you can appreciate the sense of humor, but I was the song leader by default. I really didn't know the difference between a harmonica and a flute. And George, as you may or may not know, was an accomplished musician prior to becoming an accomplished pastor. And I would just get up there and wave one arm, and he wanted me to wave both arms, and I would shoot from the hip every Sunday morning. I didn't have anything outlined. I'd just get up there, and we'd set up what we're going to sing, and we'd sing it, and that was it. And I know that George had a great sense of patience with me. He had to. Because of his expertise and me, I had the gift, I still have the gift of exhortation and mercy, and he had to extend mercy to me. There was no doubt about it. <clears throat> well, that lasted for some time, and then one day, I mean, George was quite succinct. One day, some guy showed up that knew the difference between a harmonica and a flute, and George said, this guy is leading the music from now on. Adios. <laughs> that was it for me. <clears throat> now... One other thing I've got to share with you, which is really funny. We started out in a small, confined space, I'm going to say about 40 feet by 40 feet. And uh, from me to Stephen Meisinger, there was a, a man in the back, and he was reading the Wall Street Journal one morning. And George, George was teaching the Word of God. <clears throat> he was adamant about teaching the Word of God. So he looked at this guy, and George, and athletes can appreciate this, George just very acutely just flipped a pencil and hit that guy's Wall Street Journal right in the middle. He dropped the Wall Street Journal, and George said, the word of God is being taught. Disrespect will not be tolerated. He never brought the Wall Street Journal again. I know George has many jewels in his crown. Well done, good and faithful servant. George Meisling was a very close friend of ours. Sandy and her family were very close friends of ours. We grew up together. He was my pastor. He enlightened me. He loved me despite my flaws. George Meisling was a man's man. His legacy will last for many, many decades. And I say thank you, Father God, for allowing my family to be in the closeness of George and Sandy Meisinger and their family.
Amen. Well, Joe gave you the history of uh, Maranatha Bible Church. And um, <clears throat> when we went there, George was teaching um, Ephesians on Sunday mornings and Revelation on Sunday nights. And we went there about four times a week, actually, to get Bible teaching. But there were truly a time when um, we would have fried preacher for lunch because I complained that his delivery was harsh and that he wasn't very uh, delicate in how he preached or whatever. And my husband would say, uh, he's teaching the word of God and we're going back. We have to go back because he wasn't going to go to church anymore because of religion and legalism. So I said, okay, so we went back. But on the other hand, I've determined that I could not arrange myself under a person I didn't know, I didn't respect, and I didn't trust. So I began having one-on-one -on -one meetings with George, and he consented to, to meet with me so that I could know him. And he eventually became a mentoring person in my life and let me teach Bible studies. And as I grew in the faith under his um, teaching ministry, the ministry actually was quite uh, reformative. It was revolutionary. It was riveting. It was refreshing. And we all felt like renegades out of con you know, construed religious practices because we weren't doing what they were doing in the big churches. And to say that we were thankful for what God was doing in George's life and teaching is a mild rendering of the impact it had on, this, on these people. I was his secretary for six years, and it was uh, a lot of the time we argued about things. And uh, he was very gracious with my incessant questions about sovereignty and the character of God and positional truth the hypostatic union, the incarnation, and, and these, these elements of doctrine that changed our life. And uh, his children and my children were all related in the same ages, actually. One, one step or another, they were all within one or two years of each other. So we spent a lot of time, since we didn't have family in Minnesota and they didn't have family in Minnesota, our children became like family, like siblings or like cousins. And uh, they spent a lot of time in my house and my kids spent a lot of time with the Meisingers. We raised our kids together. And uh, when Jim went to West Point uh, and became an officer, he had spent so much time in my home, it just grieved me that he was deployed to uh, Desert Storm. And I just, I, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't deal with the fact that he was going into war. And um, I had this quandary as we were learning about the sovereignty of God versus the free will of man. And how did they blend or make any sense? It was, in, it was not understandable to me and I just wrestled and wrestled with it. So I called my friend Sandy and I, she listened to me about my quandary about Jim going to war. And as, as is her way, she's a great listener. And then she asked a question to me. She said, uh, do you not know? Do you not believe that God's in charge of bullets? Do you not understand the sovereign power of who God is? And so what's going to happen over there in that war is about God's work. And, and so it's like, well, all right then. Okay then, if that's what the mother of this great officer is going to do, then I'm going to do the same thing. Because she modeled in her life such a great respect for God's word and such a great respect for the principles of the word. 
And if you believe it and apply it, and chew on it, you can also be a great Christian in God's kingdom. Um, George and I, well, we had really great times together, like I said, and we argued a lot about things. And um, he often stated that if anyone in his congregation was in his congregation for four to five years, he could stand them up against any seminary student in the Twin Cities, and they would find out who really knew scripture and who really could apply it. And as he talked about the biblical sense and the logics of God's word, I, I would wonder if he was thinking about the Elijah and the prophets of Baal, how that the, the winner was gonna be his students, because his goal was for us to be like the noble Bereans. He wanted us to be able to rightly divide the word of truth. He wanted us to be able to discern false prophets. And he wanted us to not be fooled by whatever was going on culturally. Um, so what I want to say in closing is that another conversation that jo George and I had was I would say to him, you know, you're older than I am, so you're going to die first, and I'm going to talk at your funeral. <laughs> and he would say, no, 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 that's not going to happen. He said, you're more onerous than I am. Anybody know what onerous means? <laughs> it means challenging. Um, and I was challenging, I'm sure. And so he would say, you're going to die first, and I'm going to talk at your funeral. And we would kind of laugh about that because we had very serious conversations and some of them were about our death and what was going to happen after that. And so I'll stop because I can say more, but when Sandy Meisinger called me and said, would you talk at, jo at give memories of George, all I could think about was I wonder if she knew about the conversation George and I ever had. I think not. I think it's all about God's sovereignty. I think all of us here can reconcile our situation with who God is. Uh, doesn't mean that there won't be disappointments or harm or, or frustrations, but it does mean that we have the Holy Spirit in us. Uh, we are Mary Ann Melton, my middle name is in Christ. Mary Ann in Christ Melton, that's who I am. And same for you. If you're in Christ, then you have tools and resources and applications and promises that can help life make sense. And so I'm just thankful for God's sovereign choices that he put us in Minnetonka, Minnesota, we got transferred there from Salt Lake City. We didn't grow up there, we're still there. And in closing, I'd like to say that um, I'm reasonably certain that this section of scripture was one of George thousand most favorite passages because <laughs> he loved God's word. And it's in Ephesians 2, four through nine, and it's actually about God, but George used a, ver a phrase in this passage to sign every single letter he ever wrote. So if you don't mind, I'm going to read it to you. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us, up, seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you're saved, through faith. It is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So George signed 
and, uh, and did sign in the riches of his grace in all of his professional letters, personal letters, anything that he wrote, he's, that's the way he signed his name. And uh, so thank you so much for allowing me to pay a tribute to my friend. And I think that's it for me, is that George and I were really, really, really good friends. And, uh, and I'm thankful for his wife and his children. And Sandy knew that he and I were friends, and I'll miss him. But I know he's so happy. I know that he's so complete in where he is, and for that I give thanks. Thank you. My knees are shaking, everybody. <laughs> Hi, my name's Ann Marshall. Uh, I live in California, and I knew George and Sandy um, at Grace Church and Schaefer Seminary. So I'm kind of in the middle portion here. I just I'm so thankful to the Lord that George and Sandy were such great friends. Uh, it was a true, you know, it was a wonderful experience to get to know them, and they added so much to my life. Uh, I met George and Sandy at Grace Church in the early 1990s when I visited California at the time. I was living in New York City, the Bible Belt of the East. Um, I had looked up Roxanne and uh, Patty Bedar and Stacy, who I met at Camp Shoshana in 1992 in upstate New York, after I had met Arnold in Israel earlier that year. And so I first heard George preach at Grace Church then I um, <clears throat> got to know him and Sandy much better in 1994 when we were on a five-day, I mean five-week study tour in Israel and I really got to just know them as friends, not as a pastor or anything. And we really hit it off and they were a lot of fun and we had a marvelous, unbelievable trip of a lifetime together. Uh, total adventure. And even then, uh, George had started to uh, be concerned about me, and uh, he learned that uh, I had been attending a Pentecostal church, so he was gently trying to guide me. Um, you know, he was concerned, which is his nature to be, because he was a true shepherd, always. But first he was a friend, so that he could be a shepherd. And he was concerned about my uh, understanding, and so he was guiding me uh, to study and learn, and uh, that was the first of many times that he did shepherd me in the faith. Uh, I'm, I arrived and moved to California in 1995 and started attending Grace Church and immediately enroll, enrolled in classes at CTS. And then George asked me to be his part-time secretary for the church. So you can imagine, sometimes I saw him like six days a week. Um, we got to know one another quite well. George and Sandy opened their home to me so graciously. They welcomed me and they invited me for family dinners and all holidays, you know, they, knowing that um, I was pretty much alone there. Um, and they encouraged me and they always had timely and sage advice. I'm sure we can all say that. Um, it was always timely, it was always kind, but very wise advice, both of them. As I got to know them better, I always felt they were, such a great example of a Christian couple, parents and spiritual leaders. Um, as time passed, I got an MBS from Schaefer Seminary and George again encouraged me to use my spiritual gift and he asked me to teach at the uh, Grace Church Women's Retreats, once again guiding me and helping me grow in, in my walk. George was a thoughtful and measured person. He, live a, he lived a life informed and saturated with scripture and always had a verse for each situation. He studied diligently for all his sermons and Bible studies and I think that we can all say to a person that we were blessed to sit under his teaching. In fact, today I was talking to one of my friends, um, Steve, that came with us and I said, what would you say of George? And he said, the greatest Bible teacher I ever sat under. 
So my life is so enriched in getting to know you, Sandy, and your lovely family and your wonderful. It's such an impression, uh, uh, such a marvelous thing to me to see such a wonderful Christian family. And your 12 grandchildren, it's just something I had not seen much in my life and it was just such an inspiration. So although George has gone on to be in glory with the Lord, wearing his crown, his work will live on in the lives of those who sat under his teaching, both laymen and CTS students, who have themselves gone on to be, become teachers, pastor, pastors, missionaries, and Christian workers. George, we will all miss you, but you've just gone before us, and so till we meet you again in glory, thank you so much, and thank you for the honor of knowing you, and I know you. We will miss you until we see you again. Love you, George. My name is Bill McCullough. I didn't know George until he came here. Uh, I believe the first time I met George was when he came to Albuquerque to consider bringing Chafer Seminary to town. Uh, by that time, George had already proven himself to be a man of God, deeply committed to the word, and a servant to his church as pastor, preacher, and teacher. And from that very first meeting, I, was, I recognized that here was one person who had given himself completely to the Lord Jesus Christ and his kingdom's work, a true living in front of me disciple. When Chafer began to function here in Albuquerque, I was privileged to participate a little bit uh, in the administration and organization of the school. <clears throat> During that time, I began to see George not as just a teacher, but as a teacher of teachers and also preachers and pastors as well, as he led Chafer in the effort to train men for the ministry of the gospel. Primarily, as men pastors of local churches, he seemed to me to be the absolute embodiment of that passage in Romans 10. For everyone who calls upon on the name of the Lord will be saved. And how then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how can they, are they to believe in whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are trained and sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. George not only proclaimed the gospel himself in a, a myriad of ways, all of them excellent, he prepared and led others to do so as well. Here in Albuquerque, with his responsibilities at the seminary, George did not serve as pastor of a congregation, but he continued to multiply his ministry through the church by, as it says in 2 Timothy 2, entrusting the gospel to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. I was blessed to be one of those that fell under his tutelage, and I'm a better teacher for having had George in my life. He modeled for me the Apostle Paul's reference in his letter to Timothy to the workman who, needs, who needs, has no need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. As declining health compromised his physical abilities, George continued to serve our church here in Albuquerque at Hoffman Town as a master teacher, as an elder statesman, as a pastor to our pastors and our elders, as a counselor, spiritual helper, and guide. You've heard a lot of them. George's accomplishments are many and great. 
he gave his every effort to building on the foundation of Jesus Christ in the lives of others. Just like it says in 1 Corinthians 3. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, each one's work will become manifest. For the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. I wanted to use this passage because George and I spent some, a lot of time with it. George was assured of his reward, and he has now realized that reward because it was built upon none other than Christ. That has already been proven in large measure by his impact on those of us who have known him and also the value, the gold, silver, precious stones will continue into and throughout eternity. But George will not have us praise him and honor his accomplishments. Rather, George would very humbly and immediately reflect any glory given him to his Lord. Let your light so shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. George had but one ambition before his family, before his church, before those in the classes he taught, anyone who came into his life. He sought only and always to lift up Jesus, who said in the Gospel of John, and I, when I am lifted up to the, from the earth, will draw all people to me. So we come today to honor a good man, a great man, but he would want nothing more than for each one here, that each one here would know the Savior that he knew. Acts 4, verse 12. And there is salvation in no one, no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And this man of great eloquence, a man of great effective communication, would offer a very simple but very profound description of how each one of us must come to salvation. I don't know how many times I heard him say this phrase, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. Thank you, dear Lord, for sharing with, with us for this while your good and faithful servant, George Meisinger, and for showing us what you can do in and through the life of one who surrenders himself to you. To God be the glory. Great things he has done. Thank you, Brother Bill. <clears throat> Well, uh, Brother George uh, was a great defender and lover of the grace of God. And we've already heard uh, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 uh, quoted, so I'll refrain from that. But I do want to read another, a quote from you, a quote to you from another great defender and lover of the grace of God, and that's John Newton. And he says, I am not what I ought to be. I am not what I want to be. I am not what I hope to be. But still, I am not what I once used to be. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. Can we all stand together and let's sing about the wonderful grace of Jesus. Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall its praise begin? Taking away my burden, setting my spirit free, for the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea. 
higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise His name. Wonderful of Jesus reaching to all the lost by it I have been pardoned say to the uttermost chains have been torn asunder giving me liberty for the wonderful grace of Jesus it reaches me Wonderful, the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me, broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise His name. And the last verse, wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching the most defiled. By its transforming power, making Him God's dear child, purchasing peace and heaven, for all eternity and the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus deeper than the mighty rolling sea higher than the mountain sparkling like a fountain all sufficient grace for even me Broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus. Praise His name. You may be seated. Amen. I'm uh, Charles Clough, friend of George for many years. Uh, Dr. Dean just pointed out that I've known him since dirt was created. <laughs> Not really. Um, George and I met uh, 55 years ago in the fall of 1964 when both of us were uh, enrolling in Dallas Seminary. Uh, George had come through from Bi Biola I, uh, in his music background. I had come uh, from MIT and through the Air Force uh, to, to seminary. Both of us went there not because Dallas Seminary was an accredited college. We went there because we were hungry to understand the Word of God. And we respected the people that were on that faculty. And that was what drove us forward. And uh, Dr. Dean pointed out when we started this that a memorial service is really about the grace of God working in people's lives because a memorial service of a Christian kind is done within the framework of the Bible. And one of the things, particularly for you young people, you are living in a rapidly changing culture. And let me warn you that there are consequences to ideas. Good ideas have good consequences and bad ideas have bad consequences. And when you look at the scriptures that, God, uh, that George so honored, it starts with Genesis 1.1, God created all things. You have to understand that Christianity, among all the other philosophies and all the other religions, is the only one that holds to a creator-creature creator distinction. All others basically deal with just nature is all there is. Only in Christianity do you have a God who reveals himself, who not only created, but he reveals himself and he offers grace. He is a God who for 2,000 years 
revealed himself in a series of promises. And George was always so fond of God's promises. We can today look back at the scriptures and understand many of those promises are part of contractual agreements. God pinned himself down. You don't find that in Islam. You don't find it in Buddhism. You don't find that in Confucianism. And you don't find it in modern secular culture. There is no sense of something that's transcendent. Everything is relative. So what we're doing is we're remembering George in the light of that frame of reference of the scriptures and that we believe that there are a whole set of living experiences beyond the grave. If, however, you only believe nature, then George is just a corpse. If, however, we believe the word of God, then George is actively in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So there's the difference. Well, getting back to my own relationship with George, um, we got to know each other and our families. Uh, Carol and I would go over to George and Sandy's for times when, in our little apartments that we had. And it was in those years that we began our families. Uh, George and Sandy had Jimmy and Keith, and I and Carol had Jonathan and Eric. And it's interesting that before uh, Jimmy died, um, both of them were in the military and, and Jimmy had an assignment in the Pentagon and my son Jonathan was also in the Pentagon and I didn't realize that Jimmy was there until I was talking to George. So I told Jonathan, uh, the Pentagon is a big, big building. Go look up Jimmy and at least sit down and have lunch with him, which they did. So that was the, 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 how we met. When we went to seminary, though, with the classes, we also, in the summers, went to Baraka Church in Houston, Texas. And we were very encouraged by the pastor there, Colonel Thiem, because he was one who made it unabashedly clear that the Word of God was the supreme authority. By the way, we didn't worry about microaggressions in those days. And so, George and I were fortified in our faith and we came to really appreciate God's grace there. Not only was it taught from the pulpit, but it was shown to us by people in that congregation being very gracious to both George and, and me and our families. Well, we both decided that we didn't really understand a lot about the Old Testament. We looked around and we knew that preaching to, it was basically all out of the, old, the New Testament. Very little was done in the Old Testament. So we decided, both of us, to deliberately major in Old Testament and Hebrew. And so as we were doing that, it was not an easy major then. Uh, we had a course in the history of Israel one time, I think it was in our third year, with a, a scholar by the name of Dr. Bruce Wolke. And George and I were sitting there, and Wolke, in his first week, handed out the assignments, the reading assignments. And we looked at that list, and George looked at me and says, huh, that must be the semester list. Uh, no, George, that's this week's list. Um, and so we had a good time about that. One of the things I always appreciate, George was easy to, to get along with and have friendship. He was so humble, but he also had a great sense of humor. And that uh, sense of humor, along with some ingenuity on my part, led to something that Arnold Fruchtenbaum has once said is the funniest prank ever pulled off at Dallas Seminary. Well, the situation was that it was very intense, steady, 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 and we needed a humor break. And having gone to MIT, MIT was always filled with engineers that had this great creativity for humor. I remember sitting in the dormitory there, it, like many college campuses, uh, the police were always after parking, and they would ticket cars. And so once some of the uh, fellows got together, they got an old junky car from a um, junk shop somewhere, went into the welding shop and welded parts of the frame so it would fall apart, and then wired it together and put it in a no parking zone. And the moment the policeman came, ticketed it, there were 100 students looking out the dormitory at this cop. And of course, he looks up wondering, why 100 students looking at me? Well, as soon as the wrecker comes, it pulls on the front end of the car, the whole car collapses. Uh, and, and we all had a good time. Well, anyway, to, to transfer that to, to seminary, 
Um, we have a chapel service among the seniors in the fourth year. It's called Seating of the Seniors. And it was kind of a, a thing that we really weren't gung-ho about, and we thought it was a little excessive. And the year before that, J. Vernon McGee had given the Griffith Thomas lectures, and, um, or I think it was the year before that, it might have been before. Anyway, he was talking about the best the grace of God can do. So what we thought about doing was creating this big banner using the uh, materials in the Christian Ed Department. Um, and so we created this banner, it must have been about 20 feet long, and it said, this is not the best the grace of God can do. And we wanted to put it in the back by the, the emblem in, in Chafer Chapel here. The problem was we couldn't figure out how to get it there and have it drop down in the middle of the ceremony. So we figured out a trigger device. I, I worked this thing out so that if you pulled on a thread, it would release this banner. Problem next was that, well, where, how do we get the thread from the back all the way out so it can be pulled at the back of the chapel? Well, we had others involved besides Joe, uh, George and me, Joe, Jim, Tim Aldrich. Their dad was the originator, I think, of Multnomah School of the Bible. Anyway, the five of us got together and figured this out, and the Aldrich brothers took some fish hooks, and it was open um, rafters in the chapel. And they put fish hooks all the way down with a thread running through the fish hooks to the back door. And at that critical time, Tim Aldrich got up apparently to go to the men's room and he yanked on that thing and the thing came rippling down. The faculty turns around, everybody's in hysterics. Of course, George and I and Joe and Jim <coughs> were called into Walvard's office <coughs> the second day. <coughs> and even then, the faculty had to admit at least it was a humorous break. But there's a case of George and his humor. The thing I always appreciated about George, and many of you have, have said this, is that he had humor, but he also had a humility before God because he understood who God is, that God is the creator and he's also the savior. And the salvation that God offers is related to his character. We can't understand grace until we understand his justice and his righteousness. God is a just and righteous God, and we have to deal with that. It's not our stand, it's not the Gallup poll ethics. It's his character that determines what is right and wrong. And so, how do we meet that? As fallen beings, we can't. And love, as far as God is concerned, he initiated it. Not that we loved him, but he loved us. And George was always emphasizing that grace, and I so appreciated that. So years later, when George took over the leadership of trying to start a seminary that would train people, because 2 Timothy 2.2 says, commit these things to faithful men who will be able to teach other men, where do we get these trained people? You have to have training. And that's one of the things that we are still grappling with in seminary training is to win young people in the 20s and 30s ages Remember, you've got a whole life ahead of you, and it can be a very fruitful thing for the Word of God and the Lord and for yourself to do this. George and I were part of that generation that made that decision early in our life. After I retired from the, um, being a scientist with the Army and civilian life, uh, I joined the board. Um, Dr. Dean invited me, and I thought, I want to help George. George has been so gracious to me. He's helped me out at certain points in my life. I want to help him out. So I came aboard with, uh, with, uh, uh, on the board, and um, we worked. We talking, we, George and I talked a lot about how can we have a seminary that honors the local church? Because after all, the pastor of the local church is ultimately the authority in the body of Christ. And so we wanted to set it up, and we're just now getting to the point where this is systematic, that every student that comes to Chafer Seminary will obtain a form that he must submit to his pastor or the, whoever the pastor designates so that they understand their sheep is getting training at this seminary, but as a leader of that sheep, I have a right to, under, to, to examine what they're teaching so I understand the kind of training they're getting 
And when that training is finished in certain increments, I can bring them into the ministry of the local church. That was George's dream, and that's what we are still uh, working to execute uh, at Chafer Seminary. So in conclusion, I just wanted to once again say how much I appreciated George's influence on my life, both because he enforced the authority of Scripture and because he was so gracious. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go back to holding this thing. Have you heard the drumbeat through all of the things that have been said? It's the grace of God. When we think of George, that's what we should think about, is the grace of God. He emulated that and he taught it. I've got a couple of stories I want to tell you about how grace shone through in George's life, and then we'll look at the word. But I didn't get to know George as, long, as early as Charlie did. I was around then. I was about 14 years old when they came to Baraka Church in Houston to do their pastoral internships. I don't really remember George. I sat in on a couple of Charlie's classes, which I really didn't understand, but um, had an impact on me at that time. So we've all been around uh, a long time. And I went to Dallas some years after them, and because of the influence of Charlie and, uh, and George by that time, I also majored in Old Testament in order to, to teach that. I didn't really get to know George until the late 80s. He had me uh, come out and speak at his church in Southern California a couple of times. And of course, we saw each other at pastor's conferences that were every couple of years. But in the summer of 2000, Jim Myers invited George and me to come out to Almaty in Kazakhstan and to teach uh, a pastor's conference. Now, there, there are a lot of stories I can tell you about that. One, I'll just cut to the end result, is that we first got there and we had these apartments that local Kazakh people were opening their homes to us. They normally sleep on the floor on mats and they had brought in rather primitive beds for us Westerners. And after the first night, my wife was, now tell me again why I'm not in Paris with my mother and I'm here in Kazakhstan. And so we put a little pressure on Jim and he found us a nice apartment. It was in the European part, Almaty's a big oil producing area with a lot of uh, Western oil companies there. And so we got a nice two bedroom apartment. It was very spacious, up to date, had color TV and we had cable. And we even had Fox News, which we didn't have at that time. I was in the People's Republic of Connecticut as a pastor, thanks to George. He recommended me for that, and I truly do thank him for that. That was uh, one of many ways he impacted my life. But, but we realized, because George would never complain, but I realized within a day or so that George was in equally primitive uh, accommodations and so uh, my wife and I said George you need to come stay with us we've got two bedrooms there's lots of room and so George spent two weeks with us and we really got to know each other at the end of those two weeks uh, the the couple or in the mid weekend actually the pastor and his wife who were there invited us out to their dacha that's their summer cottage and there they provided and prepared a tremendous meal for us and at that meal, they began, and we were all sitting around the table and visiting, and the hostess, her name was Jana, Jana came out with a platter of meat. And as she set that down on the table in front of us, there was something very unusual about this platter of meat. And if you'd put the picture up there on the board, you can see... It eventually got put in front of George, and he's looking at it like, what in the world am I going to do now? It was a goat's head, complete with eyeballs. And Jana informed us that, that the eyeballs were considered a tremendous delicacy, and she said they are to be offered to the most senior person here. 
they put that in front of me. George, let me see, I'm not good with math, but George is 15 years older than I am. And then there was Jim Myers, and, and Jim's five years younger than George, so I don't know what was wrong with me and why they thought I was the senior, but I said, no, 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 thank you, but uh, the, the eyeballs should go to George. <laughs> I had learned to be gracious. <laughs> and so George looked at it, and he looked at the eyeballs, and then he said, that is such a tremendous offering that you've given us because the hostess had just said that she just thought the eyeballs were, eyeballs were wonderful. And George said, I will forego the honor of eating the eyeballs because you love them so much. I will give them to you. Such a man of grace. <laughs> There's one other story about George that uh, has always impacted me. I tell it all the time because it teaches a tremendous point about grace. During the summer that uh, George and Charlie and uh, their wives were at Houston at Baraka Church. Pastor Thiem decided to go on vacation. And so he loaded up the car and he left his house in charge of George and Sandy. And they were going to house sit for the week or two that the Thiems were gone on vacation. And after they got in the car, suddenly Pastor Thiem got out of the car. He obviously had forgotten something, came back to the front door, according to George, and reached in his pocket, this is 1967, reached in his pocket and pulled out a wad of bills and peeled off five $100 bills. That's somewhere north of $3,000, maybe as much as $5,000 a day. That lot, was a lot of money in 1967. And he handed that to George and said, you're going to have some expenses and you'll need to take care of some things. So here's some money to see you through the two weeks. And George looked at him and said, no, 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 no. There's no way I can accept that much money. You keep it. We'll take care of ourselves. And Pastor Theme, who had these steel gray eyes, just leaned over and just squinted and looked at him and said, if you don't take this money, George, you will never understand grace. And George took the money. And George had a great testimony of grace throughout all of his ministry. And there are many ways that we learn from George about grace and about the Lord and about all that had been provided for us in salvation. I want to turn our attention to a couple of passages of Scripture as we think through some things about what the Lord has done in George's life. A passage that came to my mind was first, first, or excuse me, 2 Timothy 4, 7, and 8. Paul wrote this at the end of his life, and it is a statement that we as pastors hope is true for all of us. It also can be true for anyone, whether you're a pastor or whether you are just someone who is serving the Lord. Paul said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who love his appearing. George fought the good fight. The Greek there is a word from which we get our word agony, but it is used again and again as part of, of um, athletic contests. A number of different words Paul used that related to athletic competitions to communicate the struggles, the challenges, the need for personal discipline in the spiritual life. And that's what the Apostle Paul was talking about here. The, there are a lot of things we could talk about in terms of the fight. But in terms of George's spiritual life, his spiritual growth, that's one aspect of the fight. Another aspect of the fight is that we face challenges, challenges from outside of the church, challenges from inside of the church. There were times in George's life, as there are in many pastors' life, when you have to tend, take a strong stand for the truth of God's word. And George was one who did that. And that's the idea here in these verses, to fight the good fight, to uh, contend 
for the faith, as it states in Jude. But another verse that uh, came to my mind that is so important for understanding George is one that, that Titus writes in reference to an elder. Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. George did that in his battle. In Philippians 1.27, the Apostle Paul commends the Philippian believers and he says that they were striving for the faith of the gospel. That's what George did. When Paul wrote, striving for the faith, when faith has that article in front of it, the word the, it's talking about a body of doctrine. It's not talking about the act of faith, but what is believed. What we hold to be the basic truths of Christianity. And in here, it's modified by the gospel, the body of truth related to the gospel. George understood the gospel of grace that we are saved not because of any merit on our part. A great passage that, um, that was read earlier in Ephesians chapter two, that was a key passage, a favorite passage in George's life, is a foundation for that. We are saved by the riches of God's grace, by what Christ did on the cross for us. And the more we come to understand the dimensions of what was done on the cross, all of the different aspects that were necessary to save us, that we were bought with the price, redemption. It was the death of someone perfectly righteous to satisfy the righteous character of God. That's propitiation, this, that God's righteousness and justice were satisfied by Christ's work on the cross, that we were reconciled to the Father. One of George's favorite aspects of what Christ did on the cross was that we were forgiven. Colossians 2:12 to 14, that the certificate of death against us was nailed to the cross so that that, that debt was wiped out. That's the, what the word for forgiveness means. It's eradicated. The debt is canceled. It's a, an economic term. And that is the essence of the faith, that it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Now, as we think about George, as I said earlier, as we remember these things, then we're all touched a little bit by grief, by sorrow, depending on how close you are. Those of you who are the family, those of you who are the grandkids, um, you've been given a legacy and that a spiritual legacy by your grandfather that is almost without peer. It is something you should treasure. The, whatever audio tapes that are around of George's teaching, I hope that you have the opportunity to listen to those, to understand this legacy, to know, to know your grandfather and understand the importance that he placed on our relationship with God and your relationship with the Lord. And as we think about those things, we're moved to grieve a little and to sorrow. First Thessalonians 4, 13, the Apostle Paul says that we grieve, but not like those who have no hope, because we have a hope. In the scripture, that hope is a, a confident expectation. We know what is coming. We know that there is uh, a future for us in heaven. Paul goes on in that chapter to teach a doctrine that is, was very important, very near and dear to George. That is the doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. George loved the fact that we would not, as church age believers, go through the wrath to come. And he has to answer a question about death to the Thessalonian believers. And so he first says that we don't grieve like those who have no hope because they've questioned, what, what about these believers that are now dying? Why aren't they uh, going to heaven? And then Paul said, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, that's the gospel. 
If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, not if we do good works, not if we serve the Lord, not if we're moral, not if we're righteous, but simply faith alone. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. And then Paul says something that is very strange to our modern ears. He says, comfort one another with these words. See, we think of comfort in a lot of other ways. Giving a hug, uh, calling someone, talking to them, all of those are fine. But real comfort, biblical comfort, comes from biblical truth. That's why a man like George dedicated his life to learning the Word of God and teaching the Word of God. That's why he was an example to Charlie, to myself, to many, many others, to students. We have students here from uh, Chafer Seminary that are going through classes now, others who have graduated. Uh, this is the example that it is the Word of God that is alive and powerful. And that's what changes us. That's why you have such joy. That's the third thing I talked about. We come together because Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulations. And we could focus on some of the tribulations that George faced in his life. As family members, you know them well, his health, some of the challenges in ministry, other things. Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation, but I give you my joy. He bequeathed to us this joy that Jesus had, even while he is enduring the suffering on the cross, he never lost his joy. His contentment, his tranquility, his peace with God was never lost because of his deity. It, and, and that was part of his nature. But at the same time, he grieved. He goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, and the word that is used there to describe his sorrow, the struggle he faced, knowing what would happen the next day, is the same word that is used by Paul when Paul said, we grieve, but not like those who have no hope. You will grieve. There will be times when that grief blindsides you, and suddenly you're, you're moved to tears, and you're just overwhelmed, and then you refocus as you think about the Lord. There's nothing wrong with grief. It is, it is part of who we are as fallen creatures. I've often said that grief is God's wake-up call to us because God did not design us or create us to die. He created Adam and Eve in perfection in the garden. They would not have died if they had not sinned. But because of sin, they first died spiritually, and subsequently they died physically. But that was not God's intent. So every time someone dies physically, it's a shock. And we think, this ought not be so. This shouldn't happen. This is not right. There's something wrong with people who live a good life, live a life that is important to the people around them, and suddenly they're gone and we can't see them, talk to them, spend any time with them anymore. This has ripped our existence apart. There's something wrong here. And that's God's wake up call to each person for them to realize, yes, this world is not the world that it should be, but there is hope. And that hope is that Jesus Christ died for sin so that we could have eternal life. And that is the promise of the gospel. And that is why we are comforted by the words of Christ's return to us. And then in closing, I want to go to just remind you of the passage at the end of First Thessalonians chapter, or excuse me, First Corinthians chapter 15, as Paul has talked about the resurrection 
and the importance of the resurrection because one day we will all be raised from the dead. And as church age believers, we will be raptured. And Paul concludes that chapter in 1 Corinthians 15 by saying, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. George has his victory. He has been taken by the angels, escorted to heaven, where he met his Lord and Savior face to face, not by faith, but by sight. Let's bow our heads and close in prayer, and then we're going to conclude with the hymn, When We All Get to Heaven. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for George, for George as Sandy's husband, the one who was her life partner for so many so many decades and the way they grew together and the way they impacted not only their their children and grandchildren but the impact that they had on so many in their congregations and those who you brought into their sphere of influence we thank you for george's leadership above all we thank you that george was willing to let you work in his life and that he was willing to serve you and that through him, you exhibited yourself. You exhibited characteristics of yourself that we might get a glimpse of what our Lord is like. We pray that would be true for each and every one of us. We know that there are maybe some here today. There may be some who listen to this recording in the future who may not have determined their eternal destiny. This is an opportunity to do so. Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world, the sins of everyone. He paid that penalty so that God's justice is satisfied. But the issue is that we're still born spiritually dead. We're still born without righteousness. And the only way to have that righteousness and the only way to have life is to believe in Jesus. And at that instant, when we believe that Jesus died for our sins on the cross, at that instant, we are credited with your perfect righteousness, and we're declared righteous by faith alone. And we are given new life. We are born again, and we are transformed from death to life that will culminate in life everlasting in your presence. And Father, we pray that anyone and everyone listening to this message would put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation if they've never done so. And for the rest of us, we may, may we be encouraged by the example of George that we too can serve you. And even if we have not in the past, if we're still alive, God still has a plan for us. We can change direction, change course, and focus on that which has an eternal benefit and an eternal impact. And we pray that God the Holy Spirit would use these words and these testimonies from everyone here to create a tremendous spiritual impact in the lives of each hearer. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, we're going to have one more closing hymn. But on behalf of the family, the Meisinger family and Sandy, I want to thank you all so much for coming. There will be a reception to follow upstairs, and I'll give you all instructions how to get there in just a few moments. But as the scripture says, we don't grieve as those who have no hope because when we all get to heaven, we'll sing and shout the victory. So let's all stand together and sing this closing hymn. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place When we all get to heaven What a day of rejoicing that will be When we all see Jesus We'll sing and shout the victory Let us then be true and faithful Trusting, serving every day just one glimpse of Him in glory 
will the toils of life repay when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be and when we all see jesus we'll sing and shout the victory onward to the prize before us soon his beauty will behold when we the gates will open we shall tread the streets of gold when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be and when we all see jesus we'll sing and shout the victory